all bell. <laughs> he is a man of intense honor. He is an international ambassador for racing. Um, he's known as a, as a leader, um, a diplomat. He's a total legend in the Kentucky State Police. He's an icon uh, in the Kentucky Marines. Right off the bat, you knew that he was a great man. One of the greatest men I've ever met in my life. He's such a great, kind man and so amusing and such good company that he, he would be, he'd get a standing ovation anywhere, I think. Very genuine, such a genuine man. We're talking about a one of a kind man, you know, I mean, there's not a few good men here, he's, he's special. The most significant Kentuckian. If we had a category of sainthood, he would, he would be that. I think he'll be quoted and re-quoted and, and emulated indefinitely. Funding for this program was provided by the KET Endowment for Kentucky Productions, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal agency. Alltech, committed to providing natural solutions to meet the needs of the animal nutrition and health industries worldwide, where innovation comes naturally. The Keeneland Association. The Keeneland Association seeking to preserve the finest traditions of thoroughbred racing, investing in racing's future since 1936. And by these additional endowment funders. Thank you. In a life lived long and fully, Ted Bassett's experiences paralleled many significant events in our history. Though his determination transformed law enforcement, his diplomacy unified nations, and his dedication to others brought pride and honor to all Kentuckians, Ted Bassett would never call himself a great man. Of course, it is said that the first test of a truly great man is his humility. James Edward Bassett III was born in Lexington on October 26, 1921, the great grandson of a Confederate general on one side and of a successful businessman on the other. The Bassett family figured prominently in Lexington's early history. Ted's paternal grandfather was president of one of Lexington's first financial institutions, as well as owner of Squire Bassett and Sons Shoe Store. Like so many Americans during the Great Depression, Ted's father lost his job when the Fayette National Bank closed in 1933. With a wife and two sons to support, he took employment at a horse farm named Green Tree Farm and Stud. It was around this time that Keeneland Racecourse was founded, and Ted's father would have a significant role. He was elected vice president and director of the racecourse in 1940, and served in that capacity for the remainder of his life. He was a good father. He had gave me, provided me for an excellent education and supported me all during my life, and um, was very much of a disciplinarian himself to me. Um, I mean, it, it kindly and whatnot, but uh, his word was, was pretty much uh, unquestioned. Ted's mother, Jane Brooker, was also a successful business person who was dedicated to her church and her community. My mother was, was very influential in my life. It, uh, she was a very good businesswoman. We were both Scorpios, so we had tens, of, occasionally we'd had a difference of opinions, but usually she prevailed. At the age of 12, Ted Bassett went away to boarding school where he would spend the next five years. The Kent School in Connecticut helped to develop a sense of discipline and self-reliance 
a directness of purpose and a simplicity of life for the young Kentuckian. Father Sill, uh, the headmaster of Kent, was an Episcopal priest, the Order of Holy Cross, and he founded Kent in 1906. And he was a very dynamic uh, individual. The Kent School, as I understand it, had a very austere uh, kind of philosophy, and the boys had to work pretty hard, and they had to go to chapel uh, quite regularly. In addition to spiritual discipline, life at Kent would offer rigorous training in academics and athletics. Ted would excel in both. I grew to really, really love it, and uh, it still, still means a tremendous amount to me uh, of those early days and the the discipline, the um, respect for your elders. But my Kent school years were, were happy ones. And of course, at the, at the end, um, uh, my brother died in a very tragic uh, traffic accident. In 1941, Ted's only sibling, Brooker, died in a car accident at the age of 15. Two months after his brother's death, Ted graduated from Kent and was awarded the Yale Scholarship. He was also the recipient of the Columbia Cup, which was given to the boy who has shown in his life at Kent the most comprehensive grasp of life and work. I look back on it as one of the most formative years of my life, those five years at Kent. But at the end of five years, I was ready to move on. Ted received word of his acceptance to Yale University that summer and was officially enrolled as a student in the fall of 1941. Today, I'd never have an opportunity to get in. The, the scholastic requirements are so strict that, um, but fortunately, I eased in <laughs> back in the, in the 40s. Though the academic life was demanding, Ted enjoyed his classes and thrived in Yale's environment. I loved history, and I, we had wonderful instructors there. Uh, the history was something that I, I seem to like more than everything. He's an inveterate reader, never stops reading. He's always reading histories. Never lost that curiosity and that uh, intellectual excitement about participating in whatever the game of the day is. Well, he's smart, extremely intelligent, and that never hurts. And he's adaptable. If you wave a flag and say, learn this, he'll learn that immediately. And he has uh, the capacity uh, to keep learning and to keep imagining new things, um, which I think has been at the heart of that meandering kind of path, that uh, he's an adventurer. Having been a three-letter athlete at Kent, Ted actively pursued sports opportunities at Yale. He made his way to the starting lineup of the varsity basketball team and would score the winning basket in his final game against rival Harvard. These are the old-fashioned set shots with two hands that you threw up. So I closed my eyes and threw the ball up in the air, and uh, by some miracle it went through, and we beat Harvard 44 to 43. So that was about my shining light on the Yale basketball. But. Uh, what fun! <laughs> what a lot of fun! We, those, those days at Yale before the war were wonderful. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, it, it, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. I didn't understand really the meaning. There was this feeling of what to do and the unease. And um, that was when a number of us went down to New York and joined the Marine Corps. Bassett was put in uniform in 1943 and sent back to Yale in the V-12 program. The program, which allowed recruits to remain in college, offered specialized courses to prepare them for officer training. In the spring of 1944, Ted Bassett graduated from Yale University with a bachelor's degree in history and a commitment to begin boot camp. 22 of us got on a troop train and were sent to Paris Island. We started a whole new experience, a whole new world.
I was totally unaware of what we were running into. If I'd known, I'd have been really fearful and frightened. And they're on you, and the minute you put your foot down, straighten up, cut on that gas. Who do you think you are? Take those glasses off. But the thing that really got you was you were marched into the barber shop, which they have about 25 chairs. Get up in that chair and get up and take it. And then they just, it doesn't take 10 seconds. And they shear your head off. Get out of there. But when you see yourself in the mirror, whatever self-respect, whatever ego you had, whatever feeling, I'm a Yale graduate, this and that, whew, you look at yourself and you're nobody. Over the next 14 weeks, Ted would endure the extraordinary demands of basic training, developing physical endurance, discipline, leadership, respect for authority, and a willingness to overcome obstacles. I was just an average American like everybody else. But they began to, to have this highly motivated feeling of taking a nobody and trying to make a somebody out of them. And whether they did or not uh, remains to be seen, but most of us, the stamp has never left in one way or the other. And the way, way you carry yourself, the way you believe, the way you act, when you saw Mr. Bassett, the first thing you saw was the uh, stature of a Marine, I guess, mixed with that uh, Ivy League uh, Yale graduate, the bearing. Uh. Has great command presence. Um, probably had that before he became a Marine, but it certainly enhanced it. He, he never left the Marine Corps. He's still in it <laughs> to this day. After completing basic training at Officers' Candidate School, Ted became a commissioned second lieutenant and received his orders to go overseas. On December 26th, 1944, he was put on the USS Seabass and shipped to Guadalcanal. Uh, as we got off on the dock at Henderson, this old salty sergeant uh, lined us up and he said, um, all right, you SOBs, line up alphabetically by height. And so you, everybody shuffled around it, and I think it was about three or four in this line. And he said, uh, and I barked out, you first five, get out of here and get on in that truck, you're going to the 4th Marines. By the time the war concluded, the honors awarded to the legendary 4th Marines included the Presidential Unit Citation, the Army Distinguished Unit Citation, and a Navy Unit Commendation. People ask, you know, if you serve in combat, are you ever scared? Yes, you're scared. But, but the thing I think that uh, uh, makes you able to function is the peer pressure. I was a rifle platoon leader. I had 42 men under my command, and they're all looking at you. And I, I think uh, you begin to become somebody other than yourself. You're not thinking of getting a, a Purple Heart. You're not thinking of getting a Bronze Star. Or Navy. You're thinking of, of them, and all of them are depending on you. So, so it's the peer pressure, I think, that, that, that actually helps motivate you. On April 1st, 1945, the 4th Marines landed on Okinawa. By the time the battle concluded, the Japanese casualty rate approached 100%. Over 12,800 U.S. servicemen lost their lives, and 36,600 were wounded. One of the wounded was Second Lieutenant Ted Bassett. We were out in an open area moving up, and uh, the Japanese caught us in a sort of crossfire. And I was shot, a um, sniper shot me um, through my right hand. And um, then I was caught with a mortar in my right knee, which was not too severe. After six weeks in the Saipan hospital, Ted rejoined his regiment in Guam and was promoted to first lieutenant. The Japanese surrendered on August 14, 1945. In recognition of their distinguished combat record, the 4th Marines were chosen to represent the entire Corps for the initial landing on Japan. The war was over. 
But for Ted Bassett and for many American servicemen, the experience would be with them forever. There's always there the, the feeling of um, having the privilege of participating and serving, uh, the camaraderie, the leadership skills, the demands. Uh, it's just part of your mosaic. For his Marine Corps service in the Pacific Theater of World War II, Ted Bassett received a Purple Heart and a Presidential Unit Citation. However, his service would not end there. He played a key role in the development of the Marine Corps Coordinating Council of Kentucky. In 1990, he received the Semper Fidelis Award for his support in raising critical funds for the Marine Corps University Foundation and the Injured Marine Semper Fi Fund. In 2007, he received the Department of Navy Superior Public Service Award, the second highest award given to a civilian. And in 2011, in recognition for his life's work of emphasizing service over self, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor Distinguished Citizen Award. I think this impulse to give comes out of his Marine upbringing, uh, his years, those formative years in the war and what it means to be a United States Marine, but also out of a Christian commitment to doing justice and caring for people. He's sincere. Um, he really cares about his fellow man. Um, he's especially dedicated to his Marine Corps heritage. Um, it's very important for him now, especially at this stage of his life, to focus on helping other people in need. Following his honorable discharge from the Marine Corps in 1946, Ted returned to Kentucky, where he would meet his future bride, Lucy Gay. I was sort of, you know, I was, what, 24 or 25, and she was 18, and I was this sort of grisly, old, <laughs> sort of shoddy World War II veteran, you know, that took himself to a serious swaggering around. And I don't think she was too much taken with me in the beginning. It took me four years of chasing her at Smith to finally get her to even consider marriage. But we had a wonderful courtship, and uh, we've been very lucky. Lucy's a lovely, lovely woman. She is humane to the soul. She's always just been an inspiration to everybody. She's a beautiful woman and so smart. So pleasant. Lucy's a very important Kentuckian, and the, the heritage that she brings, the appreciation of the heritage that, of, of the agrarian way of life in Kentucky uh, is extremely relevant. She's been a critical piece of Ted's success, without a doubt. After the war, Ted's father allowed him a very brief transition period before arranging a job interview with the Great Northern Paper Company. Reluctantly, Ted agreed to the interview and ended up in Millinocket, Maine, where he worked as a mill hand, learning step by step the process by which newsprint was manufactured. After 11 months, he was transferred down to its sales headquarters in New York City. Being in the newsprint business and, and dealing with publishers and calling on, it's a fascinating business. It's, it's an interesting business of of the political ramifications, the leadership in the community, the, uh, the, the publishing of news and the business and the circulation, all those things I, I found very fascinating. Living in New York would also prove educational for the young Mr. Bassett, who continued to court Lucy Gay as she was completing her education at Smith College. Oh, well, New York after, after the war was just magnificent. Wonderful experience. People were coming back from the war and everybody was in a fever of excitement. There was electricity about it. The Broadway shows were big. The nightclubs, everybody was talking about what nightclub had you been to. And of course, then you had the Yankees, the Giants, and the Dodgers. On December 2nd, 1950, 
Lucy Gay and Ted Bassett were married in Lexington, Kentucky at Christ Church. They would live in New York for the next three years in a small apartment on Park Avenue. And then I was traveling a great deal. I was traveling about 10 days, two weeks out of every month on that job. So the pull to come back to Kentucky became increasingly intense. And we finally made the decision to move and have never regretted it. At the age of 32, Ted resigned from the Great Northern Paper Company and he and Lucy moved home to Kentucky. With no job prospects on the horizon, Ted accepted his father-in-law's offer to become a tobacco farmer. And I have to tell you, growing tobacco is back-breaking work. And I did that for three or four years and ended up finally growing 20 acres of tobacco, which was a, a massive undertaking. And it was an interesting time, but uh, when the opportunity came to possibility of going to Frankfurt for a desk job, <laughs> it had some appeal. In 1955, Ted Bassett met Kentucky State Police Commissioner Peter Widener III, who encouraged him to consider a career in law enforcement. In September of 1956, after harvesting his final crop of tobacco, Ted agreed to accept a position with the Kentucky State Police. My career was sort of a, you know, a, a sort of an oblique sort of thing of changing 90 degrees. <laughs> Whoever thought I would be a head of the state police, certainly not Lucy. His first week on the job would introduce Ted Foley to the enormous problems facing law enforcement. As the civil rights movement grew, racial tensions led to protests throughout the nation, especially in the South. I became very uh, more aware of the sort of um, image that law enforcement was getting. A more of a sort of um, stormtrooper mentality. The media uh, was not uh, getting a positive image of the Kentucky State Police prior to Colonel Bassett's arrival. It, was a, it must have been a very difficult time for him, I think, uh, because of the, the situation, because of the feelings between the law enforcement who were trying to enforce desegregation of the schools and the people who, uh, who were subjected to it. Then, of course, as, as all people know, the Kentucky State Police had no black uh, officers at that time. So it was a critical period in the history of this country and a critical period in the, uh, uh, certainly in the history of the KSP. But anyway, morale was low, uh, salaries were low, uh, things were not good in the State Police at that time. When Bassett was named Deputy Commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Safety in 1957, the starting pay for a state trooper was only $179 a month. The hours were grueling. There were no retirement benefits. There was too little training and too few personnel. We were having a great deal of difficulty recruiting and filling the recruiting classes. The image um, of law enforcement, not just the state police, but the overall sort of national image of law enforcement was not appealing to a young man or a young college graduate or making a career out of it. Ted Bassett would set out to systematically improve not only the image of the Kentucky State Police, but the professional standards and working conditions of its troopers. It takes about eight troopers into a room in Frankfurt and he says, fellas, by God, I want to know what's wrong. And in his unique way, and uh, of, course, of course he had the attention of each officer there. And uh, the troopers began to tell him what uh, they thought was wrong uh, with the organization. Arnold Bassett listened intently, very intently. Uh, a few more questions about what we thought would help the uh, organization. And within a couple of months, uh, things changed in the state police. There was a perception in the state police that uh, you, it was very political and that your promotions were based on, on your connections. 
And I think that he had a lot to do with eliminating that and basing the promotions on technical competence and performance of duty. Colonel Bassett uh, changed the hierarchy. He changed the post commanders across the state. He changed the assistant post commanders. And immediately, you could see the organization change. By the time he was formally appointed director of the Kentucky State Police in August of 1964, starting salaries for troopers had doubled, the work week was reduced, retirement benefits were provided, and a state police academy was established in Frankfurt. Under Bassett's leadership, the Kentucky State Police would embrace integration and hire their first black officer. And I can remember him saying these are things, not only with the, uh, the black trooper, but many other things in the Kentucky State Police. I can remember Colonel Bassett clenching that fist and saying, this needs to be done and we're going to do it. To distinguish the state police from local law enforcement, Bassett changed the color of the troopers' uniforms and cruisers to gray and the color of the car's lights to blue. Immediately, the, the gray car caught on. The blue light uh, caught on. It was accepted by the state police, and uh, it was part of a great sales job by Colonel Bassett. More efforts would follow. A billboard campaign changing the trooper's image began to shift public awareness. While appealing to the legislature to increase manpower, Bassett described his understaffed agency stating, the only thing in Kentucky that separates law from lawlessness is the thin gray line. The legislature voted to fund 100 additional troopers, and the thin gray line became a signature phrase for the Kentucky State Police. It is this man's job to help you. He performs his job well, and he performs it in many ways. For he is a symbol of orderliness in the fast-moving pace of today's world. He is the lifeguard that helps you swim safely through the crowded seas that are today's streets and highways. So as those things developed, uh, you could see the morale of the state police improve. And with a leader like Ted Bassett, uh, the morale uh, quickly grew. He loved his troopers and he, he created an environment for them to, to excel. He gave them pride of themselves. He instilled discipline. He, he raised that agency uh, to one that was respected not only by the people of Kentucky, but by fellow law enforcement agencies. In 1965, Bassett became a primary force in establishing a Kentucky State Police boys camp called Trooper Island. Located on an island on Dale Hollow Lake, the camp offers a week of recreational activities to underserved youth throughout the state. Well, they have a week there of uh, supervised activities and develop an extremely close relationship with the Kentucky State Police, which has certainly paid off for us over the long haul. Well, this, this is in part of that same program of trying to humanize us, trying to show that law enforcement is more than just halt stop, write tickets, embrace, incarcerate. It's out to help, to extend that we're human beings. We're part of the community. We're part of you, trying to help you have a better, a safer, purer life. Bassett now turned his attention to upgrading the professional standards and training of the state trooper. Most police agencies in those days had no formal training. They, uh, uh, they pinned a the badge, they, they gave them a gun, and they went to work as a police officer. No type of accreditation, and it was recognized by law enforcement and by administrators that something had to be done. The state trooper is a special breed of man. Action is his byword. The Kentucky State Police and I think this goes back to Mr. Bassett's, uh, when he fully embraced the, the concept of upgrading the training of the, the average trooper and instilling pride in them and discipline in them. And you began to realize that um, 
The answer was not always in police instructing police. You needed to have a broader sort of intellectual involvement of people with, that didn't have just the tunnel vision. This is the law, this is the rules, this is the way it's going to be. You needed to have someone with a broader humanitarian sort of um, uh, relationship and understanding. In 1966, Ted Bassett sent a letter to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover expressing his desire to upgrade the quality of law enforcement in Kentucky and requesting his advice. To his surprise, Mr. Hoover responded with an invitation to discuss the situation in person. Six weeks after the meeting, Ted received notification from the FBI that his request for funding a pilot program to train local police officers had been approved. Bassett took his proposal for a law enforcement training program to the University of Kentucky, the University of Louisville, and Kentucky State University, but none were interested. Finally, he took the idea to Dr. Robert Martin, the president of what was then Eastern Kentucky State College. Well, Dr. Martin at that time was very ambitious and very visionary about what he wanted Eastern to become. He wanted to become a university and not a teacher's college. And he was grasping for new ideas and new programs. And he saw teaching opening the door for law enforcement, uh, an avenue that he could proceed, but there would be federal grants. So he jumped on it. It was the beginning of what would become the College of Justice and Safety at Eastern Kentucky University. What started as a single classroom has developed into a 59-acre complex with facilities and equipment for all types of safety and enforcement training. The program has evolved into a national model for college-level law enforcement education offering fully accredited degrees at the bachelor's and master's levels. In early December 1967, after 11 years of public service, Ted Bassett resigned as Kentucky State Police Director, leaving a powerful and lasting legacy. Uh, as, as I look back on it, as one of, one of uh, the years of my voyage <laughs> uh, that I treasure and cherish, I wouldn't trade it. I was the only policeman in my class at Yale, I'll tell you that. I didn't really have a good plan. I should have, I should have anticipated. But um, shortly after I left, um, I had two telephone calls. One was from John Y. Brown, and uh, he was he the new head of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I was looking for someone that could handle people because we had like 600 franchises, and here I'm 29 years old, and, you know, how do you handle all these people? And I had watched him uh, in his fiery, uh, impressive, motivational approach. Uh, I offered him the job to be president of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Coincidentally, Keeneland Racecourse was also experiencing tremendous growth. President Louis Hagan and the Board of Trustees recognized that their organization required a full-time leader at the helm. Louis invited me out to talk to him, just why this John my conversations were going on. And we talked about Keeneland, and he talked about coming to work at Keeneland, and would I be interested? I think Mr. Hagen from the very beginning was uh, looking for the next generation plan and wanted to give Ted a shot. Ted Bassett is just an extraordinarily uh, talented, capable, properly motivated, credible. He's got it all. Well, all the things you'd say a good CEO has, Ted has, has in spades. Um, but I think the most important characteristics uh, that make him a standout and um, make him such a beloved figure in the industry and elsewhere are the sort of human characteristics, if you will. Though the Kentucky Fried Chicken offer was very lucrative, Ted Bassett would decline. And to this day, to this day, John Y. Brown says to me, I'm so glad you didn't take that job because you wouldn't have been smart enough to handle it. 
if you weren't smart enough to take a job that pays five times what you, you got, I don't think you'd be smart enough to do it. Oh, I kid him all the time. You got a great sense of humor. No, I wouldn't have said that mean to no. <laughs> On January 1st, 1968, Ted Bassett began his new career as assistant to the president of Keeneland. But then it turned out to be a, a most lucky, fortuitous decision I made in my life. Keeneland was founded in 1937 as a non-profit organization whose mission was to produce quality racing events, to provide a showcase for Kentucky's legendary breeding industry, and to be a responsible corporate citizen of the community. They gave birth to this place with a clear mandate to do it to the benefit of the industry, but also the community, to do it in a way where uh, financial nourishment would not be the primary motive of the people that were running it. It's important for Keeneland to keep in mind and philosophically remind itself of the legacy of its charter and the importance of its mission. Preserving Keeneland's unique traditions while improving the quality and efficiency of its racing and sales operations became Ted Bassett's mission. Just as he did with the state police, Bassett set out to identify how he could improve the organization. Those early days, uh, those early days frequently, I'd look in the mirror and say, what am I doing here? It was, it was not easy. They weren't personality complex, but it was like trying to move a battleship in a swimming pool. With complete confidence in his management skills, Louis Hagen officially named Ted Bassett president of Keeneland in 1970. Oh, he just completely took over the reins in such a gentle way that no one really realized that there was someone driving and, uh, I'd say, guiding uh, in such a delicate and also uh, forceful manner. Well, I think without a doubt, he brings out the best in people. I think in a subtle, without being forceful, without being, uh, you know, loud about it, quietly, I think people want to do well that are associated with him. He brings out that best quality. I mean, he's that kind of leader. Mr. Bassett, he is, he is a great leader. Keelan embarked on building the new pavilion, the $700,000 pavilion that we were so proud of and we were operating in an antiquated and ancient uh, frame building. And that was our first step, really, of outwardly uh, saying to the breeding industry, we're here to serve you, and we're here to reach out for what problems you may have that we may take and try to correct, particularly in our operation here, and to be more receptive and more willing to accept change that might be helpful to the breeding industry. Under Bassett's stewardship, Keeneland would continue to improve its facilities, increasing the number of barns and expanding the grandstand to better serve the community and the horse racing industry. The thing that I hope the founders would look on is as we did expand, as we increased the size of the grandstand, the facilities, the barn areas, that we were able to nurture the sort of mission of Keeneland and uh, that we didn't lose the traditional charm. We didn't lose, hopefully, um, the ambience. It's been a great example to the rest of the sport of how to get things done and how to conduct oneself as a, as a racing corporation. I think if everybody followed Keeneland's lead, we'd be a lot better off. And Ted is very much at the heart of that. I think he set a level of professionalism, uh, a style, a standard that permeates not only the work at Keeneland, but the, the perception of Keeneland and the, the image of Keeneland. Even I think as a horse trainer, I always uh, felt like we should represent Keeneland in every way with a coat, a tie, the, 
the atmosphere of the paddock, uh, the corporate box section, everything, because I think he had set such a standard here. And I think all of his employees and everything else felt the same way. He brought out the very best, I think, in this community. He takes time with people, um, and he truly enjoys everybody. Um, and if you've, if you've seen him walking um, through the, across the grounds or through the stands at Keeneland, you know that that extends from the top ranks of management and the board of directors right down to the janitorial crew and the grounds crew. You can hang with the queen or, 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 you know, the guys that were sweeping up cigarette butts on the grounds there, you know. I mean, he just treats everybody the same with the same respect that, that, that uh, uh, it's just his personality, you know. And that's part, of, uh, that's part of his leadership quality. It's what allows him, in part, to get the most out of people with whom he's working and, and who work for him. Everyone would say immediately, the first thing you want to do is have good people around you, competent, um, motivated, talented people. But the other thing I've found um, almost in each of my um, abortive attempts to uh, reorganize organizations is to be a good listener. Listen to the people you're working with. Listen to the customers you're trying to serve and try to take those issues that have merit and incorporate them. With improvements in its facilities and its management underway, Ted turned his attention to expanding Keeneland's international reputation. I think among Ted's strongest suits are that he's able to analyze the changing realities of the world and adapt to them and take advantage of them. So. Uh, when the Keeneland sales, which had always been strong locally and regionally and then nationally, he saw the opportunity to make them strong internationally. The world marketplace for thoroughbred racing was expanding. Sir Ivor, a Kentucky bred horse sold at Keeneland, won both the Irish Derby and the English Derby, showing that American horses bred for speed could conform to the European method of training. And Sir Robert was the first, and then there was Robaco and Ribeiro. And then it began to escalate the wonderful um, thoroughbred horses that our breeders here in central Kentucky were. It's through their effort and their knowledge and their professionalism of producing a product that would send out and compete successfully. You could sort of expect it, somebody from Kentucky, the, the boss of Keeneland, to be a little bit more conservative, a bit more inward looking, but not at all. He absolutely relished uh, the internationalization of racing. Now, whether that was because he realized it was the way forward or whether it was partly because he knew it'd be good for Keeneland, and Keeneland was crucial, I mean, very important. I don't know, it doesn't really matter, but he was absolutely right. Ted had the ability to understand the specialness of where he was, but at the same time, reach out to to places not only around the country but around the world that what we have in common is much greater than our differences and he would always approach it that way. With Bassett's efforts to reach out to prospective buyers around the world, the Keeneland sales events became more international and more successful. In 1976, Keeneland set records with the first yearling to sell for over a million dollars. But the most significant turning point for expanding Keeneland's international reputation came in 1984, when Queen Elizabeth II agreed to present the trophy for a Keeneland stakes race named in her honor. It was her first visit to Kentucky and her first time at an American racetrack. I think it immediately gave us, as I said, you know, a good housekeeping stamp of approval. And um, if the queen should go there, it, it should be all right. Well, she's crazy about him, let's face it. <laughs> and about Lucy, too. You could tell by her face when she was here. There are a few days in Keeneland's history where you've asked Ted about and his eyes light up. And that's one of them. It was clearly a highlight for Keeneland and for Central Kentucky. It was... Uh, uh, a great experience for Ted. It was the beginning of several friendships which have lasted to this day. Uh, again, because of the way he is and, and that, that warm and sincere and, 
inviting, ingratiating aspect to his personality. Quintessential Bassett that day was. Over the years, Keeneland's unique qualities would continue to attract dignitaries and celebrities from around the world. As Keeneland's representative, Ted Bassett was known as the consummate host. As an ambassador for the industry, he was known as the consummate guest. He is the only American to present the winning trophy for the Melbourne Cup, Australia's most honored horse racing event. We think the Derby here is, is, is important, but the Melbourne Cup is, is extraordinarily uh, important uh, uh, race throughout the Orient as well as, as Southeast Asia. So uh, I presented it, and uh, much to the surprise, I think, <laughs> and chagrin of many of the people there, but it was quite an experience. Keeneland could not have gotten a representative that could have been more effective in building uh, Keeneland as to what it is today, and he's given much of the credit. I think that uh, the Keeneland Association has set the standard. I always said they were the flagship of our whole thoroughbred industry. If, if, if tracks could model after this under his stewardship, if they could model their programs, I think that we wouldn't be fighting for alternate gambling. We could, we could stand on our own merit. The real challenge to Keeneland today is to continue to emphasize its standards of excellence, which has proven so beneficial throughout the years. Continue to emphasize quality over quantity. To emphasize unselfish service to the community and to the industry. And if it continues to do this, then in the next 75 years, Keenan will still be the envy of the racing world. In 1986, Bassett became chairman of Keeneland's Board of Trustees. Though he was less involved in day-to-day -day operations, he became more involved as an international ambassador for horse racing. In 1988, while still serving as Keeneland's chairman, he accepted an offer to become president of the Breeders' Cup. I think one of the key moments of Ted's career, when you look back on, back on it, was when he agreed to take the chairmanship of the Breeders' Cup. Uh, Keelan is a wonderful place to work, but it's easy to get spoiled here. And what happened to Ted when he assumed the chairmanship of the Breeders' Cup was uh, an expansion of his horizons. When he came to the Breeders' Cup, when we first started working together, um, he walked into the office and we were talking one day about how things were going. He said, you know, he said, this should really be fun. And it was. We had a great eight years together and he made it fun. And we became very, very close friends. The, the Breeders' Cup began to come more to life, a greater, wider public acceptance, acceptance of the media. The television was NBC and beginning to take off and the tracks were beginning to embrace. But the big interesting thing was spreading it internationally. Whether it's with royalty um, or the chairman of the racing club that we happened to be visiting at the time, um, his, he's a complete statesman. Um, the sense of humor is always there. Uh, the sense of goodwill and camaraderie is always there. Um, he is just a fantastic representative of not only Keeneland or the Breeders' Cup, whichever hat he may have been wearing at the time, but of American racing as a whole. He's brought countries together. He's brought leaders together from racing. It didn't happen because of the substance of the issue. It happened because of the persuasiveness of the personality. And I think that he is actually underneath that very gentlemanly exterior, an extremely driven man. Very, very, very determined that Keeneland should be the best very determined, de determined that the um, Breeders' Cup should be a success. With Bassett at the helm, the Breeders' Cup became an internationally acclaimed championship event, and its president became an even more respected ambassador to the industry. From 1999 to 2004, Bassett served as president of the World Racing Championship Series and was an honored guest of prominent leaders throughout the world. Though Bassett deftly navigated through cultural differences and protocols, 
there was the occasional gaffe, as when he presented the winning trophy at Ascot. I dropped the trophy, and here was in front of this assembly, and all you could hear was this collective, oh. <laughs> the queen uh, just smiled, and I leaned down and picked the trophy back up, and I did, I, you know, I was just humiliated. I thought, what in the world? And then a few days later, when he was back in back in Kentucky, he he rang me to say that um, he had dropped the trophy on his toe. Obviously, he wasn't wearing very thick shoes, and it had really hurt, but he hadn't said anything. So he'd gone when he got home. He went to the doctor, and fortunately, it had hurt a bit, because I think they discovered that he had a melanoma on his foot, and they got it very early on, and all was well. So. Although it was embarrassing for Ted at the time, it was the best thing that could have happened. Another two or three weeks passed, and finally he showed up one Sunday morning, and he was limping. And he said, why didn't you come to see me in the hospital? I said, I didn't know you were in the hospital. I don't have ESB. You have to tell me. And he said, well, I was in the hospital for two weeks. He said, lost my toe. He said, the queen dropped the trophy on it. <laughs> Throughout his four decades of service in the horse-raising industry, Ted Bassett's mistakes were rare. His successes were legendary. As um, unintelligent and as uh, naive <laughs> as this statement would be, but I always sort of looked on it as a game. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. But to me, it wasn't uh, necessarily the end of the world or falling off the planet if you failed. And the staff always, um, I would say that to the staff during my time, said, now look, it's, it's just a game. And they would say by, behind my back, he says it's just a game, but don't lose. <laughs> Uh, whatever he tried, he was pretty successful at doing, uh, to what now I see as a life of enormous significance. And there is a real difference between success and living a life that has significance for others. Uh, he's always got a cause going on. And I, I can tell I, that he's got a look in his eye when he's on the hunt for a cause. He gets this look in his eye and he's looking around. The first one I, I really became involved with on a community-wide thing was saving the Calumet trophies. When the legendary Calumet farm was put up for sale, its collection of trophies was a unique treasure that Ted Bassett thought should stay in the Bluegrass State. He envisioned the newly constructed Kentucky Horse Park as the perfect home for the collection and headed a fundraising campaign to keep the trophies in Kentucky. He was one of the few people that ever, that first got the horse park and why it was going to be important and why it was going to be important in Central Kentucky. It was a, a credibility launch that I think had other people more attracted to the horse park that this is going to be something special. Fundraising is not rocket science, <laughs> you know, it truly isn't. But it's effort and it, it's not anything that is so complex. It's believing in what the effort is and what you're trying to do. And he usually starts with, this is going to be the last one, but do you realize that this town needs a blood bank? We need the, 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 the blood center in this town is just not in good shape. It's so important. You know, only 10% of our population don't donates blood. Last year it was a heart campaign. We, we've got to break the record, all-time record, for the best ever heart dinner that we've ever had. I had been working with them then and had had some knowledge of, of the campaign. So I was willing to step up there. And then there, there for a while it's the YMCA. Uh, do, do you realize what kind of shape the YMCA is in this town? On the YMCA, it was very evident what we had to do. The what, downtown Y was sort of archaic and antiquated in the building. We had the property given us to in Beaumont and north in Lexington, with that whole area up there was not being served. So there was a good good motivation to do it, and and uh, I think we raised, I, don't, I think, somewhere around 14, 15 million. And I am convinced that without Ted Bassett at the lead, 
of our charge to raise the dollars that we raised, we would not have been successful. He was everything to the success of our campaign. This belief is, listen, the awards I've gotten for it really are undeserved. I've gotten them on the back of those staffs, of those people that taken a whip and uh, sort of uh, hammered them into doing it. I can't tell you how many times I saw this over the course of our campaign. John, we can get this done. You will get this done. We will never give up. Firm, but very compassionate. You know, he was not going to let us fail. And at the same time, he was really supportive. So it wasn't like he was trying to be overly assertive. He just was being a cheerleader, a really good cheerleader. Ted Bassett would never give up on improving the lives of his fellow man. Though the list of awards he receives from a grateful community continues to grow, he humbly declines credit, insisting that he is the recipient of the most good. One Sunday morning, uh, for before the communion prayer, uh, Mr. Bassett, as we often call him, shared uh, a uh, statement that I believe is his personal code of honor that represents in many ways who he is. And he says, one gets happiness from peace of mind. One gets peace from what one gives to others. This is where happiness resides by being a giving person, a generous person, a kind person. It is important to have honor, for it is honor that helps you stand by people when they are in trouble or need. It is honor that will help, help make, make you, you a loyal person. It is honor that helps make you help people when you are really too busy, when you are really too tired and too distracted, and when no one else will even know or credit you with helping. Happiness comes not from your head, not from your intelligence, not from your ambitions. It comes from your heart. To emphasize service above self by embracing the spirit of caring for others and following the true instincts of your heart will be the true pathway to genuine happiness. If I had but one wish and had the opportunity, it would be to do it all over again. Funding for this program was provided by the KET Endowment for Kentucky Productions, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal agency. Alltech, committed to providing natural solutions to meet the needs of the animal nutrition and health industries worldwide, where innovation comes naturally. The Keeneland Association. The Keeneland Association seeking to preserve the finest traditions of thoroughbred racing, investing in racing's future since 1936. And by these additional endowment funders. Thank you.